everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Diamond Bandits. I'm Orrin Phillips, and today's episode is a great one because we have our pal Gregory Wright joining us. Gregory is an artist, a writer, a magician with the grill as well, and we'll get into that as well. Uh, Ray has worked on some really cool projects from Deathlock, Silver Sable, uh, he's on Superman, he's on Mobius, all sorts of great characters throughout Marvel and DC, and as well as, you know, independent books. Uh, we get into that. We talk about his friendship with the great, the legendary legend, D.D. Chichester, and so much more. So, here we go, our interview with Gregory Wright. I'm to be joined by Gregory Wright. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, we'll start it off the same way we do with everyone, and that is asking how you discovered comics. Oh, well, you know, because of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm about, I'm 60 years old, so back, back in my day, uh, comics were everywhere. You know, if you went to the grocery store, there was a rack of comics. If you went to the drugstore, there was a rack of comics. Every single, you know, if you went to the newsstand, there was a rack everywhere you look. So I discovered that there were comics, you know, when I was really little, you know, three or four. And I, I probably, I think I started out, you know, getting things, you know, my, my parents would buy them for me. And they were like, you know, the, the Harvey comics, you know, Richie Rich and Casper and Hot Stuff and Little Lotta, Little Dot. Um, and then... There were the classic comics, you know, they thought they were giving me something really good to read. Um, and then Archie comics, of course. And then there were all the, um, you know, the various companies that did like Disney comics and whatnot. I, I discovered, you know, those. And then my my very first superhero comic, um, my, my grandmother bought it for me uh, in West Virginia. And I can't wish I could remember the, 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 the issue number, but it was uh, it was the the Neil Adams cover that was Batman. It was a Batman comic. It was uh, with two face on it. And Batman was hanging upside down on the front of a ship and big two face in the back, very famous cover. Um, and I really hated it because it was nothing like the Batman TV show. And I, I just couldn't understand why he didn't look like that though. He wasn't drawn right. You know, he didn't act like this guy. There was no big fans and poofs. And I don't even think Robin was in it. <laughs> So then, you know, I went back and read it again and again, and I go, wow, this is really good. And and so Neil Adams art was actually the very first art that I got as superhero art. So that's what I thought. All superhero art should be like Neil Adams art, where that was, you know, more realistic, had this great rendering, had some really great color on it. Um, you know, so that was for me, that was the introduction to uh, comics. Very cool. Now, do you have any of those comics still? I still have that comic. Yeah, yes. I do. I have all my comics from when I, I was a kid. They're not, they're in terrible shape because they didn't, you know, back then, you know, it was, most people bought a comic and they threw it away. Uh, I, I thought I was the crazy one keeping all these comics. I had no idea people actually even kept comics until, you know, years went by and I went, oh, maybe I should put these in bags so they don't disintegrate any, any further. Um, you know, cause I bought them to read them. I wasn't, you know, and I still don't really believe in collecting comics. You know, they're, I want to read them. Right. There's so many times that we ask that question and I think it's, you know, more common where people for whatever reason, yes, they've had it for a while. They part with them. And then later on they scramble to get them again because, right. you know, they realize like there's, you know, they're so there's a lot of nostalgia to them and they were great comics um first and foremost and they're like what was i crazy so but <laughs> yeah you know because i i you know like a lot of people i i read comics up to a, a a certain point where i i discovered girls um and i was i had a job working and you know we were going out and doing stuff i didn't really think about comics again up until i was in, i was in college and uh, one of my very best friends dg chichester um found himself broke and he went and got uh, found a paid internship at Marvel Comics, which led him to becoming an assistant editor at Epic Comics with Archie Goodwin. And then when uh, when we all graduated from uh, from college, he said, hey, there's an opening in the Epic department. And that's how I got into comics, um, because, you know, he, there was a job with Epic Comics. So I, I got that job. But while he was working there, he kept bringing back comics. And, you know, at that time. He was bringing back Frank Miller's Daredevil and he was bringing back uh, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. And then this little comment called Watchmen uh, came out. So there was all this stuff that was really good to read 
and it reignited my interest in comics again. I went, wow, you know, I forgot how great these were to read, you know, um, and, you know, I used to, what I always liked about them is, you know, we didn't have, you know, streaming services or videotapes. So comics were a great way to be able to reread a story that you couldn't see stuff like that on TV. Um, and they did movie adaptations, you know, so being able to like reread the Star Wars movie in comic form um, was awesome, you know. So th right. those got a lot of use because I would reread those like like crazy, you know, and I bought every stupid movie adaptation um, that came out. Um, but there were some great ones, you know, Walt Simonson and Archie Goodwin did uh, that, the Aliens, which is still uh, unbelievable. Uh, they did a really great Close Encounters, um, and I think they did Indiana Jones. Is the first? Uh, I think they did I Raiders so. of the Lost Ark, maybe, maybe. Um, but it was funny. So Walt and Archie were two people that I actually knew of in comics when I started working in comics. Um, and lo and behold, you know, while I'm interviewing for my job at Epic, who walks in? But my my to be boss Archie, uh, and I actually got starstruck. Um, you know, and he goes, "Oh, don't mind me. I'm I'm only in charge." And I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know what to say because I was like, it's Archie Goodwin, you know. Uh, and then he's refilling a candy jar because he always kept a candy jar on his, his desk that people would come in and take candy out of. So he, he was offering me candy. And I was like, no, no, that's that's OK. Um, so, yeah, so that was, you know, it was interesting to like suddenly somebody that I actually knew, somebody that I had admired, but just walks into the room while I'm having an interview. Uh, it really it threw me, <laughs> you know. Um, but very quickly, you know, he, Archie was one of those guys, you know, that, that he was just such a regular guy that um, he put you at ease right away and never treated me like I was the, the peon that I, I was at the time. Um, so that was cool. Very cool. So you, you, you kind of touched on it, but how did you turn your, your love of comics into a career, but specifically as a colorist? Well, I really only took a job at Marvel because I needed to do something that earned money for rent because uh our actual goal was to we went both, both dg tijester and i both went to new york university um and we studied filmmaking um and i in specific i was studying a lot of cinematography and lighting um so when it became apparent that we weren't going to be the next steven spielbergs and the little independent film we were hoping to get off the ground wasn't going anywhere but comics was really fun and it's very similar to making movies. You know, everything we learned at the film school, I could apply it to comics. So I, I came in understanding storytelling much better than a lot of other people and understanding how to use the lighting to help tell the story and the color. Um, so, you know, you didn't get paid a lot back when I was an editor. So you had to kind of supplement it and you try everything. So everybody wants to write and it was hard to get some writing work. Um, I tried penciling and that was not going to go well. Um, I tried inking and that that went really poorly as I didn't really understand how to use the, the tool. And as I'm scratching on, on, my, on the thing, of course, it's catching on the paper and just ink is flying everywhere. Uh, I went, OK, that's not so good. And I, and I thought, well, if I can't ink, I probably can't letter. So I thought, well, color, I should I can do color. So the staff colorist there, Paul Becton, uh, he taught me the basics of color. And I actually started, the first color I ever did was Archie gave me his little Archie editorials that were in the Epic Comic magazines. Uh, and I would color those, um, which was, you know, only dropping a few little things down, but I got paid a full page rate by, by Epic to do it. Um, and it kind of got me going, oh, you know, this is really cool. And it, you know, opening a comic and saying, hey, I colored that, even though all I had done was put three colors on it. It was, a, <laughs> you know, I got a big kick out of that. Um, and then when I started working for Mark Grunewald, we were doing the Marvel Universe. And that meant we were constantly having to do color corrections on stuff. So I started out doing a lot of color corrections for Marvel Universe. And then one fateful day, um, Jim Owsley got fired. And when Jim Owsley got fired, uh, his assistant at the time uh, had to get an issue of Merck out the door in four days or he was going to get fired. And all they had was a full script was written and Mark Beecham had done layouts. So about, I don't know, probably about 10 or 12 of us spent several days, complete days and nights at Marvel Comics. And we light boxed it all up. And then we inked as much as I, you know, I, I did ink some pages, but not the whole pages. I like, I ruled things. I did the black stuff and did a couple backgrounds with the pitographs. But the big thing that I wound up doing 
was the all night coloring session where with uh, me, it was me, John Wellington, uh, Adam, and that was, I think that was pretty much it. Uh, and I, I realized how much fun it was to color and how I actually understood how to color. I just didn't know what the codes were or what colors we had. So I had to help that. Um, and I said, hey, I can use all of the my lighting knowledge for that. Um, and once I started doing that, uh, artists started responding because suddenly people were paying attention to the lighting that they were putting on the characters. Um, and I wasn't just coloring everybody their normal colors because um, that's how a lot of comics, you probably remember a lot of older comics, you know, Superman was always colored that same blue, that same red, that same mm -hmm. blue every time. Um, and I said, well, what if it's dark? You know, he would be darker. What if he's in brighter sunlight? Or what if a red light is shining on him? And I would do that or add a highlight um and and that was very satisfying so that was that's how i kind of became a colorist um by you know applying what i learned but the first real job i got was it was west coast avengers annual number two and i really hated the current colorist on the book and i, I begged mark runewald was i was now his assistant editor i said let me do this over the weekend i'll do it on spec if you don't like it you don't have to pay for it and we can hire whoever you want and he said, well, I can't really say no to that. We have plenty of time. So I, I, I took the weekend and I, I poured my, all my work into it and I brought it in and, uh, and he liked it uh, and he paid for it. I was like, oh, it feels so good. Um, and then I showed it to all the other editors and very quickly they were all giving, you know, because books were always late. So I was constantly coloring a page or two from almost every comic at Marvel. So I would take home 20 pages of, color, of page, pages from different books and have to color them and try to match the colorists that were doing it. But because I did work on Marvel Universe, I knew all the characters' colors. Um, so I was kind of like built-in reference. Um, so yeah, so that worked out well until I said, I got to stop doing this and, and work on a, a book that it's, you know, uh, for, for me. So I'm, I'm not, you know, constantly copying, you know, what Glynis is doing or what Petra is doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I needed to do my own thing. And, you know, fortunately I started getting that opportunity. So I, I, I liked your, uh, I found what you said about lighting very interesting because I, I, I find it to be extraordinarily important really for any type of medium, whether it's comics, painting. Uh, I do a lot of video work and, you know, shooting and editing with it. It just, really makes the shot you know obviously yeah. um other parts of it you know are come into play but the lighting if you get that right it'll make even the worst film just look amazing oh it does you know it, it, and we learned that in in film school they you know we would look at you know beautifully shot films and how it looked somewhat like it was a better movie you right. know than a film that was you know terribly shot i, I used to laugh at, i used to call most of the coloring three's company in color um, and if you remember the TV show Three's Company, it's a typical sitcom. It's just brightly lit. Mm -hmm. There's no storytelling with the color. And they didn't know what's color storytelling. And I said, well, it can be as simple as making it look like night or making it look like uh, a cloudy day or, you know, saying I'm going to, you know, or, or just I, I used to like to take every scene. I gave it a different color scheme so that you could tell I was now someplace else because artists don't necessarily draw something different um you know so you can wind up having you know and jim shooter made it worse because he wanted white everywhere so he you know colors were constantly putting white backgrounds everywhere it looked terrible um and he didn't know what he was talking about in uh you know and so you know i would i would add white backgrounds just to keep him quiet um because he would oh you can't do this and you can't do that and you know and finally Barry Windsor Smith came in one day. He was talking about white space. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, Jim Shooter says this. And he goes, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Here's white space. And he showed me on his color guides that he had just brought to me how he had used the white to be the brightest part of the page and how you had to have these other colors around it. And I just, my brain just went, that makes sense. And he goes, but you got to have the white. Otherwise, you can't see these other colors. He said, if you just put blue all over the place, it doesn't look blue. You got to get some white and you got to put a bit of red. Otherwise, you know, and Tom Palmer was another one that would go over the color theory with me. But it wasn't until Barry showed me his pages because he had a lot of white space on his pages. But it was very deliberate white space to draw your eye there, not just random bits of white, which is what Shooter thought was white space. Um, hmm. 
so yeah, it was good to get that that very important lesson from Barry Windsor Smith, um, who was actually more irritated that I didn't didn't know that already. Um, <laughs> What was your experience with Epic like, and what did you learn as a young man about the industry from your time there? Well, it's funny. I I began my staff time at Epic, mm -hmm. and I ended my staff time at Epic. Okay. So when I I you know what I learned at Epic originally was that there was nothing more important than the creator because they were creator owned titles. Mm -hmm. So everybody there did everything they could to make sure that the comics that were being put out were as good a quality as they could be with, with the printing and that the, the creators were happy. Um, Cause you didn't get to do an Epic comic just cause you had an idea. These are the cream of the crop uh, of, of the creators. People who would not work for Marvel would work for Archie Goodwin over at Epic, you know, and they were doing, you know, these gorgeous things like moon shadow with these beautiful painted pages. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was very important that they got scanned correctly, that they got, printed correctly so you know we would do, go and do press checks and you know all this you know stuff that was you know did not happen on the marvel side um you know i learned to be very careful and to you know also to ask creators what they think about stuff you know so at epic it would never have occurred to us to hire somebody without talking to the creator we were not allowed we couldn't do that anyway so if we had to hire a, a different artist for a book we had to consult with them um, and, you know, it was always easy. You know, we just consulted and we said, well, this is what we were thinking. OK, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so you learned, you know, and I learned how to deal with a lot of egos because mm -hmm. it's their book, you know. Um, so when I moved over to the Marvel side, first thing that I was surprised at is at Marvel, it's just tough shit um, mm -hmm. that, that we're going to change your story completely without telling you. It's tough shit that we're giving you an inker you don't like. We're not even going to ask you these questions. Um, mm -hmm. We can just fire you at will. Uh, and this was a big shock to me. Um, and I said, well, I think maybe we should ask the penciler what they think of this particular inker and stuff. And that really got a lot of creators um, on my side because people weren't asking them. Uh, and usually it wasn't a big deal. It's like, oh, I really hate this inker. Why didn't you say something? Because then they yell at me. Like, oh, well, how about if we use this inker instead? Oh, that'd be great, you know? Um, and, and it was, you know, and the same thing with the letterers and everything. Um, but I, because I understood the whole production side of what was actually possible, um, that was very helpful to, to the other editors at Marvel who just, they didn't do that. I mean, with the exception of like Carl Potts, who knew everything about design and production, but the production manager at the time was an imbecile. And, you know, she thought you could glue balloons down on painted pages um and thankfully one of our because the bullpen got people were great so they they stopped that from happening but she would say no we can't do that and i would say you're wrong we did that at epic every day well but no no there is no what we can do it you can say we're not going to pay for that but don't tell me we can't do it we can do it and I, I was constantly having to prove that but i was shocked that most of the other editors did not understand that or that they were so cavalier and just changing stuff i mean we were just you know, redraw artwork on the artwork. You know, we take it down to John Romita and, you know, they would electric eraser out, you know. <laughs> you know, you know, sometimes they would actually put a patch on, you know, because John just, I mean, if it was a, you know, if it was something like John B. Summit, Tom Palmer stuff, he's not electric erasing that. He would, he would make a patch and he would put that patch on. And he said, I ah, know. So you, you know, some, at some point somebody could rip it. He just did not have the heart to destroy um, any of that. But, you know, we could do that, you know, you know, and, and it wasn't, you know, and artists kind of knew that was the thing. you know. And, and again, I would offer artists, hey, we need to fix this. Do you want to fix it or do I you want me to fix it? Oh, no, I'll fix it. I'm like, OK. And, and But they would thank me because they weren't even given that opportunity. It's like if we had time, why not have, you know, the artist or I said, just come in and fix it. You know, because I would have people in my office fixing artwork. And I'm like, why do you have them fix it? I said, because they wanted to come in. I said, now I'll take them to lunch and we all get a free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Marvel pushed the Epic line as much as they could as far as advertising went? Marvel didn't have anything to do with Epic, really. You know, okay. Marvel, there was, you know, the, the marketing and sales at Marvel basically was their own thing. And they didn't really, it's hard to, they were kind of at war with each other. They okay. wanted to promote what they wanted to promote. Uh, and Marvel wanted them to promote what they wanted them to promote. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it was, you know, and they all thought that Carol Kalish was going to try to take over Marvel, which I don't think was really the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, she was actually brilliant. You know, she started the direct market. She made the direct market actually a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Had she uh, lived a lot longer, I think things would be a lot healthier with a lot of those markets. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they, you know, they didn't really, you know, Epic kind of went and had went directly to them and had published things, you know, did their own kind of marketing and stuff um but it was it, you know that stuff you know none of it sold all that well because it wasn't uh the main characters you know and like you know what what the hell is steel grip starkey and the all-purpose power tool you know mm -hmm. all, all you had was you know alan weiss you know um you know if you wanted to buy alan weiss's stuff um, but you know certain things like moon shadow it was never a great seller but everybody mm -hmm. acknowledged that it was brilliant um but it was you know mark the mattis you know mm -hmm. uh, great stuff but then once they did like you know uh, Electra Assassin, you know, you had Miller, Sienkiewicz and, you know, Electra, that was a big deal. And then, you know, Walt and Wheezy Simonson with Jay Muth and Kent Williams did Havoc Wolverine. And that was a huge mm -hmm. seller. But again, you had, you know, high powered people on a, a book that you can already sell. And of course, Marvel's marketing department, they love to sell anything that was already going to sell. Um, and I used to say, no, no, your job is to take the stuff that sucks and figure mm -hmm. out how to sell that. You know, anybody can sell the X-Men. You know, it doesn't need any more help, you know, but everything else does. Um, but they didn't like they didn't quite enjoy the my, my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and a name you mentioned before, uh, Mark Grunewald, yeah. uh, who, who for everything people say, just an absolutely wonderful guy. Uh, <clears throat> you know, somebody we lost again too soon. Yeah. What was your experience like working with him and what did you learn from him? Everything. I, you know, Mark. Mark was the heart and soul of Marvel. Um, you know, and again, working on Marvel Universe, you know, you you wind up becoming obsessed with stuff that, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with telling stories. You know, we are so continuity obsessed mm -hmm. that, you know, Mark and I used to write stories in the books that we were writing to correct continuity things. And he would call me, hey, there's this problem that this one somebody did with this character. Let's do a two-part story. You're in Captain America and Silver Sable and correct this. And I went, okay. Um, but you know, he was a very funny guy, um, you know, pre shooter getting fired. He, he was kind of depressed, um, because, you know, Jim shooter was, you know, he would just, he was the destroyer of creativity is the best way to put it. Um, and, and you know, after he got fired, Mark sort of lit up up until, uh, Tom DeFalco said, I want you to be my executive editor. And Mark didn't, Mark really would have preferred to stay just editing comics. Um, but he, he wasn't going to say no to Tom. Um, but you know, he, he kind of re woke up and got very creative, but you know, Mark was very generous. You know, he was happy to give ideas to everybody. Um, no ego. Um, you know, he, he taught me to really understand. He taught me to really love every character, um, instead of just, you know, the characters that I came in really liking. Um, and he gave me a huge amount of responsibility that I hadn't even earned, which I thought was amazing. Um, you know, cause he immediately handed, he said, you're going to handle all the artists. I'm like, what? Cause well, you worked for Epic. So you know how to handle artists. Uh, and then he goes, Oh, by the way, I've got this graphic novel. He goes, I want you to, 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 to finish this off. And I said, Oh, okay. What is it? He goes, it's a Wolverine and Nick Fury. Oh, great. Nick Fury. I love him. My favorite character. He goes, I said, well, who's doing it? He goes, Archie Goodwin and Howard Chaikin. I was like, Oh my God. And I'm like, well, what do I got to do? He goes, well, you got to get Archie to actually finish writing it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> What about Chaikin? You know, and he goes, oh, you know him. And I said, well, a little bit. And he goes, well, you got to get the light of fire under his ass and get him to work. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, because I was very intimidated by Howard at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I lit a fire under Archie by calling Howard. And I said, you know, and, you know, and Howard, and I, Howard is a really great friend of mine now. But, you know, when I talked to Howard the first time, you know, I was just like, this is what I need. He was like, well, I can't draw anything without the script. I need the script and I'll, I'll do the ink pages. And then we started talking about what we wanted to do. And he wanted to use this. He wanted to do this very different way of coloring it. Um, and he was going to use these guys in his studio. One of them who's a very talented guy named Richard Ori, who I had no idea who he was. And he was going to have him paint a lot of the backgrounds. Now, I didn't know who this guy was or what was his. And I said, OK, that's fine. And he said, wait a minute. What do you mean that's fine? I said, that's fine. He goes, you don't even want to see his work. And I said, no. And he goes, why not? And I said, because you're Howard fucking Chaikin. And I said, there's no fucking <laughs> way that you're going to give me some fucking shit colorist, you know, to ruin your work. It's not <laughs> happening. 
So I said, <laughs> I trust you. And he, he went, he goes, as well, you should. But he was so surprised at my, because I mean, what, you know, Howard's going to say, I want to use this terrible guy. You know, that's something <laughs> like you guys do. Well, I want my friend to ink it. Not happening. Right. Um, you know, and when the pages came in, I just, I couldn't even believe what I was seeing because he, I mean, they painted a lot of back. I mean, like Machu Picchu is suddenly painted in that wasn't there. You know, these, if you ever see the black and whites of, of the, have the, that graphic novel, there's not a lot there, but he, it's, it was meant that way to have the people paint in the stuff. And it, at the time it was very revolutionary because nobody had done that before. Um, and now people look at it and go, you got to really look and see how much was painted in there. But that was brilliant. But that was like the first thing that Mark said, you handle this. <laughs> like, oh, you're, you're going you're gonna to make me handle Howard Chaykin. But, you know, there was nothing to handle. Howard just did the work brilliantly like he always does. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just having, you know, yell at Archie. And I said, you know, and I said, Howard wants to ink. He needs script. Um, you know, so it was a daily thing. But it was funny. So I actually started my career working with Archie. And there was no point in my entire career that I wasn't either working for Archie, working with Archie, or being Archie's boss. Wow. Uh, literally until the day he died, because we were doing, we were working on Starman together, and we'd done all of the um, Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale, uh, Halloween books together. Um, so yeah, I, I find, you know, it's like, I mean, it's very gratifying that when he moved to DC, he brought me over there to do work at DC, um, which made me think, wow, I actually must, I must be really good at something here, because, you know, this is Archie Goodwin calling for me <laughs> you know, that's like the best endorsement ever um so yeah so you know I, I was very lucky you know i had the best bosses uh anybody could ever have so you um as a writer were at marvel during the 90s oh yeah <laughs> what was that experience like and did you just i mean this is like the second renaissance of of comics of that time and you know Everything is selling amazingly. Uh, Superman's dying. Batman's getting his back broken. There's X-Men everywhere. What is that like as a writer at Marvel in the 90s? Well, the problem that I had was I really didn't like to say no. Um, and But everything that I was interested in writing wasn't necessarily things that were the big sellers. So... Um, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I started off editing Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., and then I wound up writing it, you know, for the last six issues. And that wasn't selling, but I was determined to try to fix that. But they canceled it. Even as sales were going up, I was writing Silver Sable, um, which, you know, again, not not a hugely popular character. I was writing Morbius, not a hugely popular character. I was writing Deathlock, um, which we had so many bizarro problems happen with uh, with it. Uh, that it it stopped kind of selling and just just as as everything you know kind of you know as, when Dwayne McDuffie left and it was finally just one writer because you know there were, we were like shifting back and forth and it really didn't work for the fans because they were like I like this one but I don't like this one I was like oh for God's sakes um, you know it was bad enough when Butch Geist quit the, the miniseries and nobody wanted to follow Butch Geist except for Dennis Cowan. And the thing problem with Dennis, Dennis's work doesn't look anything like Butch's. Uh, so it was like two way different styles. The only thing is Dennis is a brilliant artist, you know, uh, and if I could have gone back and just had him redraw the whole series, that would have been really great because we had written and created the whole series for Butch Geis art. And now we had to rethink for Dennis. Dennis tried to be as, as Butch as he could, <laughs> but he's very, he's just very Dennis. And, you know, Dennis, the, what Dennis does is, is very unique and it, it's exquisite. And I was thrilled, but it definitely it was another weird monkey wrench because people, the kids who liked reading, who wanted to see Butch Geist artwork, they didn't like Dennis Cowan artwork. Um, you know, and I knew that was going to happen. But when we started the series off, we had Dennis. We're okay. We're going to have Dennis. It's, we're now we're going to, we can gear it that way. And that went very well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was just, but the book between the two writers going back and forth. And then we had a bunch of different artists for a while. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was strange. But, you know, in the nineties, I was also constantly being told, we'd like you to leave this book that's not selling and create some new book for us because we want more number ones. Uh, and I'm like, no, because I, if I said, if I'm going to create a series for you, I'm going to want to do at least six issues and you guys keep canceling them at issue three because they don't sell as much as you want. I'm not doing that. Um, and Mark Grunewald had that happen with, I think it was called Star Masters. Um, mm -hmm. 
they canceled it and he didn't have an ending. So he, 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 he called me and said, Hey, you know, do you want to finish the series for me in uh, cosmic powers? And I said, sure. Um, and that was weird having to finish somebody else's story. And we had to finish it, finish it because they weren't, they didn't want it to go on any further, but you know, it was you know, Quasar and Beta Ray Bill and, you know, all these great characters. Um, and they just canceled the book on it, like right in the middle of the story. So it was very frustrating because, you know, there was all those horrible, horrible covers. They, they you know, and they, they didn't actually design the covers to take advantage of whatever the gimmick was. Um, you know, there was a couple that worked really well. There was a Ghost Rider cover that was just the head of Ghost Rider and it was glow in the dark. Oh, that was great. That worked really well. Jim Starlin did a couple covers with the Silver Surfer where silver foil on the entire character in his surfboard. That works really well. Um, mm -hmm. He did a warlock cover where the entire background was this sparkly stuff that worked well. But, you know, they would just take any cover and they were, well, figure out where to put the metal foil. You get one color. No, that that doesn't work. You know, and I, I can I remember going to John and saying, John, and he goes, they 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 made this decision. He goes, I said, can't we, we need, you know, but we have to design these covers. He goes, there come there's too many of them. I can't redo them all. Um, and it was terrible because I hate I hated those gimmicks and because and people would buy we're putting foil on this cover. Now it's a crappy cover, but you bought, you know, millions of them. So I'm kind of happy I got the money for that. But they just, I found them very, because I had to color a lot of those. I'm like, I don't know what to do with this cover. You're telling me to place the, the one color of foil where? You know, you know, if you just don't put a background in it, and then we can put some kind of weird thing and that'll be okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they did it with Silver Sable, the first cover, you know, her outfit was silver. Yeah. Um, that, that sort of worked. But the cover wasn't designed to show off that as well as it should, she should have been very big on the cover, you know. And what do you do with her face? Now her face looks funny. And they they also did a uh, like a like a 3D stamp of it, so you could you could you could you know touch her boobs. Uh, <laughs> well, that's what people did. Look, you can. I mean, that's what everybody. Look, you can touch her boobs. I'm like, you know, uh, I, if you thought of it that way, then you would have drawn it a little different. <laughs> guys it's so realistic yeah it was very it. strange because they they were okaying just about anything uh because almost anything sold so there was a lot of terrible stuff that came out um i hope some of it's not what i wrote but um <laughs> you know it was great because you could do, would do as much work as you wanted but mm -hmm. you know you remember i mean how many punisher series do we need how many spider-man series do we need you know it was just absolutely insane that's how the midnight suns uh came about is they, what, Ghost Rider was successful, so they said, let's get a bunch of other books, because, you know, Howard originally wanted to do just a Blaze book, and they turned that into Spirits of Vengeance, because they didn't think Blaze would sell, so we'll have both Ghost Rider and Johnny Blaze in, in that one, and then, what you know, the whole Midnight Suns, it will just glom onto the, what Howard is doing there, so, you know, they, they stuck Morbius in there, who was basically a science-based character, they didn't want to use, Doc, they wouldn't let us use Doctor Strange, which would have made sense to use, we didn't use him. Uh, Christian Cooper came up with the Darkhold, which was actually really very cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then they they came up with the um, uh, Blade and uh, Hannibal King. The um, oh, like, oh the the death uh, death dealer. No, no. Um, um, oh. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> it was like a you know they're like Ghostbusters sort of. Right. But, um, <clears throat> I can't believe it. And my friend D.D. Chichester got to write that. Uh, some of Ron Garney's first work, but that whole thing was created to make money. Um, and, you know, and it was just, and the problem was, you know, all the books were tr you know, crossing over and leeching off of what Howard was doing. So it kind of weakened, you know, Ghost Rider a bit. And then as soon as I started writing Morbius, it was like, how many crossovers can we do at once? And I was like, wow, I did a year on Morbius, not writing one single story I had intended to write, which is why they gave me the book. Wow. So that was the nineties, you know, is there is, <clears throat> you know, in your time there, you clearly saw a lot of stuff oh, uh, yes. and you have opinions. Is there maybe like, you know, uh, a particular story or character, something happened and you would have done it differently to really kind of, you know, turn it on its ear, or really kind of shake things up a bit? See, it's hard to say because, you know, coming out of Grunewald's office where consistency was so important you know i i wasn't a big fan of altering characters um uh you know it's like i i hated when they did the ultimate line i thought it was a slap in the face to everything uh, it saved marvel you know people liked it and some really great characters did come out of it um but yeah you know it, it wasn't 
I don't know that I don't there was I never really thought you know this is how you know we should do it you know I mean I thought you know like Frank Miller he did the definitive version of Daredevil um, I didn't think there was any need to you know monkey around with it Walt Simonson you know kind of that that's the way you do Thor um, although I love what Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends did on Thor you know they did it they took it back to a little more uh, you know Biff Bam Boom Jack Kirby ish um, kind of Thor which was great but yeah you know I didn't you know I just I I was more trying to fix stuff that I thought was going poorly. I, I thought I want to see better stories. I want to see stories with more depth. I want to see more characters that are less, not so much ciphers. Um, you know, so when, when they gave me Silver Sable, I said, I don't want the wild pack to be just a bunch of idiots that are like Star Trek guys in red shirts that get killed. Um, so I created a whole bunch of characters that I was interested in writing. Um, and and they were different. I, I wanted to see some more different characters. You know, when you know, Dwayne and I came up with Deathlock, our version of Deathlock, you know, we made him a pacifist, you know, mm -hmm. and he wasn't a hero. Uh, and that's why we got the book. Um, so I wanted to see more of that. I wanted to see, you know, more intelligent stuff because the stuff that I like to read wasn't what a lot of the comics really were like. You know, I mean, I, I like the X-Men because Claremont was, he was the one bringing in all, he was really bringing in interesting characters very different diverse characters and powers and not everybody who was bad was necessarily bad and sometimes the heroes became the villains and that that was very intriguing to me um whereas a lot of comics was you know the, the hero just went and did the heroic thing and came back you know uh you know it's like superman i just i would never want to write superman uh, he's just to me the most boring character i i you know always i like the character i like the more street i loved writing daredevil you know, here's a blind guy who's a lawyer who, who knows the system's all screwed up and goes out at night and tries to fix stuff uh, against the against the law. What a what a cool, you know, way of thinking. And I, you know, Nick Fury is my ultimate favorite character. You know, the, the original Nick Fury. Um, you know, and again, he's he's pretty much a regular guy who's been around, you know, for like eighty some years. <laughs> you know, and he just has to use his wits. I thought that's an interesting character for me um yeah silver sable she, another, again she for me she was very interested when they asked me to write some x-men stories when they were going to do like an x-men unlimited and they needed stories i couldn't think of a single thing that i really wanted to do um because it's like well chris has already done everything that's interesting you know I, they're not going to let me you know do some you know do something terrible to wolverine you know i mean you know, you know we all want to write wolverine you know but you're just going to write chris claremont dialogue um so yeah, I mean that was you know that, that was my curse because I didn't want to I didn't want to write the big characters. Mm -hmm. So when a, a series came up that I wanted to work on, I had a couple of times they said the sales and marketing said no, he can't write that because his name's not big enough. Wow. Well, thanks for letting me do two months worth wow. of book beforehand, um, and then they got somebody you know who's already writing too many books that had a name that wrote it, and the book got canceled in three issues anyway. So. <laughs> Well, yeah. you, you spoke a bit about Deathlock, which is a book I like a lot because, like you said, in this one, he was a pacifist in this killing right. machine's body. Um, yeah. And with Silver Sable, the team she had around her, I mean, you had Sandman on the team, yeah. but a lot of the other fellas who were on the team weren't the most lovable group <laughs> of guys. Like, one guy was, he's somewhat racist. Oh, no, he was very racist. He was, he was, yeah. okay, <laughs> no, 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 he was a, a sexist, misogynistic, racist yeah. Uh, and and a narcissist, you know. So, I was gonna say, for you, when did you hit your mark as a writer? Was there a series you worked on, or um, a, a singular issue that you really kind of felt like you were hitting on all cylinders? Uh, you know, Silver Sable. You know, when I I started, I I really wanted to try to make her less of the she, you know, just the the sort of mercenary bitch, you know, because prior to that. You didn't really see any human side to her. She, you know, she showed up, made some funny quips, kicked everybody's ass, uh, and and said and 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 complained about stuff. You know, I mean, you know, very cleverly. Um, and I, I said, no, I, I want to figure out uh, who she is. And and Tom DeFalco, he just let me do everything I wanted with that book and that character. Uh, you know, which you know he and Ron Friends created it, and he just gave me his blessing, which was a shock. Uh, and he liked everything that I did, which was a shock because I did some things, you know. So he got a little annoyed when I I did the abortion story, um, uh, which I, I specifically did um, for two reasons. One, I wanted her to consider, you know, her mother. 
Um, and I wanted her to consider what it might it be like to be a mother. I mean, obviously she can't be a mother, but she had to consider it. Um, and I wanted to tackle the whole abortion issue from a different angle. Um, I said, well, what if somebody forced you to have an abortion? You know, because everybody wants to talk about banning it. It's like, well, what if somebody told, ha, was forcing you to have, well, what would that feel like? So that's what I did. I, I had, you know, she wasn't even asked. She was, you know, they, they made an appo appointment for her to have an abortion. And she was like, what the, <laughs> um, hmm. so I got to spend a couple issues and nobody noticed I was doing this story. <laughs> and then Tom came to me, he goes, Hey, <laughs> what's going on with this? And I went, what do you mean? He goes, you can't have her have the abortion. I said, I'm not going to. Yeah, he goes, well, you can't have her give birth to a baby. And I said, I know that. Well, she can't have a, a miscarriage. And I'm like, I know. And he's like, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm not telling you. Uh, and he goes, what? I said, you'll you'll be happy. Just trust me on this. You know, you can read the plot when it comes in. Uh, you know, and it, I just made it. It was a, it was an error. Um, but I wanted her to have that full experience of thinking about it uh, in the story. And I, I really felt you know, on Silver Sable, I was trying to do those kinds of stories where I was really trying to dig into the characters because these were were my characters. Um, you know, uh, you know, Deathlock was was belonged to me and Dwayne. Uh, so, you know, up until, until Dwayne left, you know, even after Dwayne left, he just he wasn't my mind. But all these other characters, except for Battlestar, who Mark Grunwald, you know, gave me uh, very generously and said I could do anything I wanted with him. But I tried to give them uh, you know, some, something to them, you know, like Battlestar, he was unemployed. That's why he wound up at Silver Sable. He needed a job and he was going to do whatever he could do to get one, you know? And then I, so I, I, you know, but I had him and then I had the racist. So I had, I was using him to try and get the racist to see that, Hey, black people aren't so bad after all. Um, and I was trying to do a lot of, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of this, this stuff that today people, Oh, you're just so woke. You know, you know, it's like, yeah, you know what? Go fuck yourself. That's how woke I am. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, for me, it was it was these were kind of characters that I thought would be interesting to write. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I wanted to do, you know, because it was really dull whenever you did a fill in issue of, of something and you had to take the character where they started and you had to leave them right there. And you couldn't really do anything with them. Mm -hmm. Whereas on Silver Sable, I was able to do anything I wanted. If I wanted to, you know, like the crippler, the sadomasochist. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, I created him in another book. I was actually, I actually was going to try to do a whole book of just him. And that didn't go over so well, as you can probably imagine. But I had a lot of fun with him there because all these characters could, could, you know, ping off each other very differently, which I stole from James Cameron's Aliens. Um, if you remember the, you know, that whole crew of, of the guys at the Alien, how they, you know, they were all very different, they, you know, you know, and didn't necessarily get along. So you got great dialogue between them, but when they had to actually do something, uh, they worked beautifully as a team. And that was what I, I wanted to try to do with that. And I, I feel like I did a good job with it because Mark Grunewald would say that was the first book he would read in the pile, which that was a big compliment for, to me. Uh, and Tom DeFalco liked everything I did. I mean, he never stopped me from doing anything I, I did <gasps> there. Um, so I would think that was probably I really felt like I was, you know, it, it was mine and nobody, you know, and nobody ever stopped me from doing any of the stuff I did on. There's a few things they probably should have, you know, the, the penis God storyline, somebody should have said, <laughs> but that wasn't, that was, again, that wasn't all me. That was me and my friend, my DG Chichester again, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we got in there and did that. So we did that only to get promotion. We were looking to get some promotion for the art for uh, Silver Sable, Terror Inc. And um, Cage. So Marcus McLaren was also, you know, in on that bit of bizarreness. And we did all this pre-work. We got all the stuff for the promote, and then they didn't promote it. <laughs> we, we were pretty pissed. We had a great time, you know, doing this bizarro story. I mean, I mm -hmm. have this guy giving people orgasms on panel. Yeah. Uh, nobody said anything until the last edition. They were like, because, you know, the character's name was Priapus. Yeah. Nobody got it until, like, Bob Budiansky at the end, he goes, hey, do you know what that means? And we're like, Yes. He goes, did you do that on purpose? I said, did you read the story? He goes, oh, my God. He goes, how did this get through? And I said, I don't know. He goes, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then they reprinted in the cage uh, trade paperback, of all things. It's like, there's so many stories of mine that are from Silver Sable. Like, Why can't those be reprinted somewhere? <laughs> you know, like, a stupid Deadpool one that shows up, and then that one. <laughs> So you said, I mean, you had a great time doing Silver Sable. It's more of a real world based book. But when you're doing something like Midnight Suns, where you have Supernatural, where you have a lot of, you know, darker characters, 
how does your mindset change as a writer? Well, I'm a huge horror fan, always okay. have. So that's right up my alley for one thing. Um, and I had also been working with Clive Barker. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so Just him. Some of this weird sexual uh, monster stuff that leaked into the Priapus thing in Silver Sable, Cage and Terror Inc. Mm -hmm. uh, was also, you know, kind of in my head uh, when we were doing, I was doing Morbius. Um, and, you know, what we wanted to do was we were trying to, we wanted to get rid of the code and we wanted to make those books more like Vertigo books. Um, and that didn't really go over so well. And the powers that be kept telling us to make Morbius more heroic. And does he have to really bite people and drink their blood? <laughs> well, that is the point of the character. Um, yeah. So I responded by taking one of the characters that Len Kaminsky had come up with and I turned him into the nastiest villain I could think of that you couldn't, you couldn't kill him. And uh, he, he would really, he would, he was, he would just rape and rip people to bits and get their powers mm -hmm. and then they would burn him and they'd chop him up and he would put himself back together and um, slaughter. That was his name. Uh, yeah. That was my response. Okay. You want, you want that? So I just made it more, I made it more violent um because that was the whole point of that character and i never got to do this story because i was really trying to i wanted to write a book about uh, the tragedy of turning yourself into a vampire mm -hmm. and it was just crossover 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 um and you know i don't think a lot of the people that were involved necessarily understood horror mm -hmm. um i mean and, and not not the writers you know because at one point it was, we had david quinn <laughs> you know, who, who wrote Faust, he understood mm -hmm. the stuff. And I mean, Frank Levici was in there at one point. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, Dan and I were both, you know, from the Clive Barker world, but, you know, some of the, the, the staff that worked on the book didn't, they just, they didn't understand the horror very well. Um, you know, cause the best horror comic I ever worked on was Nightmare on Elm Street, mm -hmm. um, which, which uh, we did two issues. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, and I, I was working with Bob Budiansky on it. And I said, let's get Steve Gerber to write. <laughs> I said, and I, and I said, and I'm going to set him loose. I said, you just write the most twisted stuff you can come up with. Uh, and then we had Rich Buckler did the, uh, did, did some layouts for it. And mm -hmm. then I, I got, I think it was, I got Alfredo Alcala and uh, Tony DeZuniga. And I, and I, I, so I don't want to see any of this crap that I've been seeing recently. I want to see this old black and white stuff. And they said, yeah, I want to see all the drippiest, the gooeyest stuff. And they just killed it. It was brilliant. It was exactly what a horror comic should be. It was black and white. It was scary. It was twisted. Uh, and Joe Jusco did the brilliant covers for it. Two issues came out. And then the, the, the head, the, the, the very heads of Marvel, Jim Galton or whatever, they went, well, what's this? You know, you can't have this. People are complaining. I'm like, we did our job. And, you know, we had a third issue ready to go and they canceled the book on us. I was like, really? You canceled a book for, for doing it the right way. What did you think you were getting into with Nightmare on Elm Street? Yeah. Did you not watch the movies? Uh, no. You know, that, and that was the big thing. I was like, well, you know, I had to, I was editing Robocop and the people at uh, Orion Pictures didn't know their own character. They kept wanting him to have a robo dog and a kid sidekick. And could I not have him shoot the gun? I'm like, no, this isn't a Saturday morning cartoon. This the Punisher audience wants this guy, you know. So every single month, I would have to go through this again and again because they kept switching licensing people who'd never seen the movie, didn't understand the movie, had it in their head that comics were for babies. I'm like, no, no, no. Um, and poor Alan Grant, you know, who I hired him because as Judge Dredge had a great sense of humor, he was doing this great stuff, and we had to edit it all out. And you know, he stuck around much longer than I would have if I were him. Um, but I felt terrible because it, it, I mean, I was like, this was supposed to be a really fun comic. I loved Robocop. I love that first movie. This was great. Oh, it's an amazing movie. You know, it, and, it made Orion. So I don't know how they yeah, well, did not, were they, they were not aware of that character. No, you know, when, after the book, when the book left me and it went to Bobby Chase, they like calmed down and just let them do what they wanted with it. And then when it went to Dark Horse, they started doing like what they, we should have been doing. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was great to see it finally get done right. But I was like, why do I have to have my name on these ones with the stupid stuff in it that we had to put in there? So yeah, that's, yeah, the nineties, you know, a lot of people didn't know what they were, they were doing. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned um, our Clive Barker, because I love, I'm a huge fan of Hellraiser. And, oh, you know, yeah. we talked to, to 
to DG Chichester and discussed his time working on the Hellraiser comics. Oh yeah. How did you get involved with Nightbreed and working with Clive Barker and all of that? Oh, well, going kind of back to when you talked about my time at Epic. So okay. once I became a full editor, I was a full Marvel editor and Epic editor. And Dan and DG Chichester had left staff. So I inherited most of his books, which included Nightbreed, uh, Hellraiser went, I think it went to Marcus McLaurin or it might have, I'm not sure who got, I, I wanted Hellraiser, but um, I didn't get that one. Um, so I wound up with a lot of those horror things. So when I got Nightbreed, the funniest thing about it was um, they were, they had done, Dan had already done all the work on the movie adaptation that was done. And it was supposed to start up a new series. And it didn't have anybody. And he said, gosh, you know, I think I'd be the perfect guy to write it. I said, gosh, you're right. Do you want the job? <laughs> I immediately hired him. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, coincidentally, at the same time when that happened, um, uh, uh, Brett Blevins, who was working with Wheezy Simonson on New Mutants, uh, found himself uh, unceremoniously booted to the curb because they found this kid named Rob Liefeld uh, to come in and, uh, you know, create a few, you know, silly things like Deadpool and Cable. And I, th I think he made the sales go up a little bit. Um, yeah. So it happened so, to him. You don't. Yeah, I know. You know, uh, so, you know, Rob, Rob, you know, so Brett was available. I was like, this is awesome. I'll get Brett to do Nightbreed. Um, so Brett couldn't start it right away. So I called my buddy Bush guys and had, and he actually agreed to do, uh, an issue or so and then brett came on board and then brett decided that because he just had a young son he maybe he shouldn't work on these terrible monster things and i went no brett the monsters are the heroes so i, I had to con brett into doing this stuff so then dan writes the, his first storyline in which somehow he decides to make me <laughs> the villain <laughs> of, of the first storyline and then you know i get it's all the it book gets going and then i leave staff so my name is only on the issues of Nightbreed that I didn't edit, which is the movie adaptation. And then all the work I did on the issues that I'm the bad guy in, <laughs> uh, Marcus McLaurin's. I mean, they, my, my name's in it as a thank you, but I just found it very funny. Uh, but I did have to, but they, you know, Dan was also writing this Nightbreed Hellraiser uh, crossover called Jihad. Um, and they said, Nobody else can edit this, so you should, you're going to take it with you, freelance edit. So I took a bunch of stuff. I should have taken more. I, I took a, a Punisher graphic novel that um, Jim Starlin was doing with Joe Chido because they didn't want to work with anybody else. And mm -hmm. I took Carl Potts' um, uh, Wolverine Punisher graphic novel because he didn't want to work with anybody else. Um, and originally, Jim Lee was supposed to do that one as well, uh, but he didn't do that. So then we hired Mark Silvestri. He did a couple of pages. And then, oops, Mark went to Image. Uh, and then I, I found Gary Erskine, uh, who did a brilliant job. Um, but yeah, so that was another one, you know, because Jim Lee was doing my Punisher Nick Fury graphic novel that he and I co-plotted that nobody's ever seen. Um, there's 20 pages of it finished. It's brilliant stuff. But unfortunately, X-Men took over and then Image took over and then DC took over. So no, we will never probably see that unless Jim quits DC and Besides, you probably know, not happening anytime soon. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I, 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 you know he's, he's, you know, he's made some very good decisions for him, but ah, that kills me that that that'll never see fit. So that's mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, so that's how I wound up getting involved with Clive Barker and the Nightbreed and the Hellraiser, and uh, and then I got to you know, and I got to write. You know, Dan needed to take a few weeks off, so I got to write uh, three issues of Nightbreed, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, and I kept doing horrifying things in it. And I was like, Clive, are you sure this is okay? Goes, yeah, I love this. I'm like, you know, nobody is more enthusiastic to work with than Clive. You know, he, he really didn't, he didn't mind anything we were doing with his characters. Um, you know, he's a really fun guy, but your brain starts to work in a very different way when you kind of enter Clive's universe. <laughs> yeah. Can I just tell you, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I've read, you know, um, I started, so I've seen the movies. I, I started to read the Hellbound Heart and I got a little creeped out and I had to put it down. But then I read a lot of the other, other like uh, comics and some of the more recent uh, Hell, Hellraiser comics. Yeah. And it makes you wonder. And I think it's the same holds true for like Saw movies and things like that. That someone had to think this up. You know, someone had to sit there and be like, okay, I'm going to have this guy 
you know, chained up and then hooks are to come flying out of here and rip them apart. Like, you know, what goes into this person's mind to come up with this stuff? And it just goes into like the darkest places. And yeah. it's one of the few horror movies or series that, you know, like as a kid, it always freaked you out, like Nightmare on Elm Street and Jason and all that yeah. sort of thing. But you kind of grow out of that. But that one, like Hellraiser and that stuff, like it's still just kind of very uncomfortable looking stuff. It is. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that Clive, you know, told me to get this this book um, and it, that to, you know, to understand some of his thinking. Uh, and it was a book on like scarification, you know, the people that do body things to themselves. And and some of the stuff is not for the faint of heart to look at. No. Um, but he found it beautiful um, and not in a creepy way. Just, you know, he, he so, saw the beauty in it. He sees the, all the beauty in these these monsters who, you know, they looked horrible or they looked deformed or they looked, you know, like they had you know, their face peeled. He, you know, and he saw that. And, you know, when I started doing it, I started thinking about some of the characters that I was going to write. You know, well, how do I make this sadomasochist guy not a monster? Um, you know, how do I? you can't make my racist character there's just nothing about him that you know he's I, I he was horrible but you know you start thinking about that and you think about dr doom didn't think he was a villain you know uh, magneto did not think he's a villain you know submariner did not think he i mean submariner started out as a villain um you know he's not a villain and you know but you kind of see things that way but you know i mean some of us you know we just sit around and think of horrible things for you no know, apparent reason you know it's like when you get irritated with something you think well what would that be like and you know you just keep pondering it and pondering it and you go wow if i ever told anybody about this but oh wait i write comic books you know um what how would i do that and the problem is see clive is an artist so he could draw some of his fantasies out same thing with neil gaiman is actually an artist he can draw his stuff out tim burton is an artist so they don't have to depend on writing this stuff and waiting to see will an artist get it um because if you think of some of the stuff in hellraiser and stuff you know, if you didn't see a sketch by Clive, you wouldn't believe that he actually meant the description that he said, um, you know, and I think that's one of the things is, you know, artists that, you know, really have, you know, I mean, there, there are comic artists that are beautiful illustrators, but they can't think up anything. If they don't have reference, they're doomed. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've described a scene and I got back nothing, um, you know, or a monster and it's like nope that's terrible you know if only i could actually sketch out what i'm thinking in my head um you know i would have to send you know reference but you know i don't want this to look like this thing that barry windsor smith drew i want it to i want it to look original um and you know but it is that the more you you draw and play and stuff it's like you know uh, i think of you know when when i would sculpt um you know you start sculpting a face and the next thing you know your finger slips and oh wait that's interesting and then the next thing you know you've drawn you created this hideous looking monster uh, and then you just keep adding to see what 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 happens you know i mean it's the you know creativity is free um which is what's really fun but you know it depends on what you you know i watched a lot of horror movies i read a lot of horror i used to read a lot of horror novels i love science fiction so a lot of that stuff seeps you know, it just sort of seeps into what what you want to do. If all all you want to do is watch Beverly Hills 90210, that's all you're going to get, um, and that's fine. You know, but I, I watch you know everything. You know, I just watched the documentary on the American Gladiators, and I'm going, oh, loved it. Oh my god. So I was like, this is great. I said, I if, if I'm writing a comic right now, there's a lot of stuff I would be utilizing from what these guys say and how they were feeling afterwards. You know, I thought, well, that's kind of how Battlestar was. He'd done everything he could. And then they just kicked him to the curb, you know, so he needed, and I'll, you know, that I was like, Oh boy, I could have worked with that. But yeah, that was great. I, I mean, but again, I would watch stuff like American gladiators and, and sex in the city. And you get these different sorts of things in your head because, you know, you just can't live on it. I mean, a lot of people, I guess they live on a diet of one thing. And I just, I don't, you know, I like a lot of, I like to read a lot of different comics. You know, it's like, you know, Gru was one of my very favorite things at Epic. You mm -hmm. know, the pages where Gru would come in. That was the greatest thing. You know, I get to read the comics before the kids would get to read them. And I got to read, you know, the big black and white art that Sergio did. And, you know, sometimes, you know, he would come in and, you know, and, how you doing? Whack! And he'd slap you on the back. And, you know, he was, <laughs> you know, it's like, he was strong. Joe Kubert, you shake Joe Kubert's hand, you might not get a hand back. Jack Kirby, very <laughs> strong handshake. <laughs> wow 
you know, the things you remember about, yeah, what do you remember Jack Kirby? He crushed my hand. You know? <laughs> Very you, nice man. I see. You've been an editor. You've been a writer. You've been a colorist. Yeah. Is there one, could you have seen a career focusing on one or did you need to have all three to be as good as you were with all of them? I, I have a lot of trouble focusing on one thing. Okay. Uh, when I wrote stories, I wrote them in color because I was going to color them. And originally it was, that was the way I, I could get more money. I, I'm going to write the story and I get, please let me color it. But I was writing them in color. So I was writing visuals that I wanted to color and I wanted to color to tell a story. So by the time I started working on comics that had really good stories, I was having writers calling me because they knew I was going to do color storytelling. Um, and that's how I hooked up with James Robinson, who was the writer on Starman. Um, so he wanted me because I did a Terminator story with him over at Dark Horse in which he really didn't like the artwork until I colored it. <laughs> and he said, you fixed the stuff the artist didn't put in. It was just mood. So he wanted me on Starman, but also Archie Gooden was the editor of Starman. And then the artist was Tony Harris, who I had discovered um, at a Heroes Con and he was doing horror comics, uh, and funny enough. And I said, my God, you know, I need to get you over to Epic. You should be doing Hellraiser and stuff. Um, and certain, suddenly I got offered a three issue stint on Nightbreed and I went, ah, get Tony Harris. So Tony actually did that. So Tony wanted me on Starman. So the whole Starman team basically wanted to work together. Um, and again, it was all about that sort of doing the color storytelling, which I don't think I would have tried to tell the story in color as much if I wasn't writing as well. Um, but, you know, editing, you know, I, I, I couldn't even really pick a favorite. I mean, now all I mostly do color now. Um, but yeah, doing the three made it better. But, there, you know, a lot of people are I find the better comics tend to be done by people that do more than one thing. So, you know, we have a lot of writer artists. Um, some of them, you know, Dan Panosian's now, you know, like doing everything, you know, I don't know what, the, I don't know, I don't know where like the brilliance of him came from, you know, it's like, I remember, <laughs> he was, you know, doing, you know, the, the image style inking, and he was just trying to do work. And then all of a sudden, his work is brilliant. I mean, it's just everything I see, I'm just shocked. His mm -hmm. color on top of it is gorgeous. Um, it's just brilliant stuff. Um, but I think he got a lot better when he started penciling and inking his own stuff and we started adding color to it his stuff got a lot better howard shaken is my prime example of a guy that once he started doing his own thing his work just took an astronomical leap mm -hmm. you know when he started doing um um american flag yeah. uh, you know it's you know it's it's what he wanted to be doing um it's the kind of stories and the characters he's interested in doing the art and the storytelling the way he wanted to do it um, and it made a big difference. You know, the Walt Simonson's, well, Walt Simonson's different. You know, his work has got better when he does his own writing, but it, it, he's brilliant with, with him. You know, Frank Miller, uh, you know, all these guys, when they become triple threats or stuff, I think they do a lot better. And at Marvel, if, to, if you're going to be an editor, I don't, I mean, honestly, if you can't do a, a couple of the disciplines, you're not going to be a good editor. You know, if you, you better be able to write a comic. And you should be able to do, you know, most of it, you know, because when I got my job at Marvel, Mark Grunewald, writer, he could ink, he could pencil, he could color. Bob Budiansky, he could do the same. Carl Potts, they could do the same. Larry Hama could do the same. He had all these guys that could do all this work. And that's one of the things that made them phenomenal editors. Um, and, you know, they, you know, and, and when somebody, would, when they were critiquing a creator, they knew what they were talking about. You know, I mean, I couldn't draw that used to frustrate me to death. So I would drag them down to John Romita and have John Romita go at them for a while. But I understood the storytelling, you know, and you brought me shitty storytelling. I'm going to rip you to pieces. Um, you know, and I was lucky. I, you know, we had the great Jim Novak in the bullpen. And, you know, we had, you know, so they all taught me about lettering, um, mm -hmm. which I had no clue about how that worked. You know, originally I thought it all looked the same. How stupid was I? Um but, it, you know, and then Shaken, uh, he'll tell you just how important uh, Ken Bruzenak is to his art. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he considers that a crucial part of his art um, and won't stand for anybody just calling Ken just the letterer, you know, um, you know, because it's he taught Howard the importance of the design. And, you know, Walt Simonson kind of feels the same. Um, so, yeah, again, I had the best teachers ever.
Um, yeah. That's awesome. It was. Uh, <laughs> that really? It really um, was. Before we go, I want to ask, uh, do you have any upcoming projects uh, that we can look out for or where can people follow you on uh, social media? Well, I'm on Facebook. You just look for me there. I'm easy to find on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, I think it's she writes stuff. Uh, mostly it's just pictures of food because I, I do a lot of cooking. So um, and I do I, I actually do a lot of charity barbecue. So I got one of those coming up Saturdays. So we're cooking for I think 600 people it's for uh, veterans who've um, uh, had limbs removed and they're playing a softball game but you know th these guys are hardcore softball you would never know <laughs> that yeah. they don't have limbs um so we're cooking for about 500 so uh, yeah so instagram is usually mostly food pics but facebook's the best place to find me um i showed up on threads but i probably never look at it i'm on twitter very rarely you know i, I show up and if somebody mentions me i you know I, oh thanks um, <laughs> um you know it's like if you guys are on twitter and you you post this i'll i'll do a thank you oh i'll be over here <laughs> Where'd you get the name Dollar Bin Bandits? It's a great name. That's Orin. I just came up with it because uh, <laughs> I don't have a lot of money. So when I go uh, comic <laughs> shopping, I hit up the dollar. <laughs> but you know, you know what drives me nuts is people keep pulling up the, the, the one comic I wish I we never had anything to do with. And unfortunately, I worked on it. Joe Jusco worked on it. Jimmy Palmiotti worked on it. Dennis Cowan worked on it. Nightcat. Oh, finds Nightcat in that in in the dollar bin. So and it's a great Joe Jusco cover. It's so terrible. And there so was a terrible. whole record involved with that too. When she was, oh my uh, gosh, it was ter very nice lady. She came into the office. You know, you couldn't mm -hmm. take your eyes off her. She was gorgeous. But you know, Stan Lee came up with this thing, mm -hmm. and we were like, we're going to work with Stan. Well, not really, because you know, Barry Dutter actually wrote it, and him and Jim Salakrub kind of put it together, and then you know the story was based on her story that she wanted to tell and it was just oh you know you know but you know dennis was on board and and then jimmy was on board so i was on board and i think janice chang was on board for, for the lettering and we all were just like why did we do this project you know we thought we were going to be working with stan and we didn't <laughs> <laughs> you're part but of history comes up so often like oh please you know, how about, you know, Fool Killer? Nobody ever brings up Fool Killer. It's like one of my favorite things I worked on. Um, and nobody ever brings it. I didn't sell. Brilliant stuff. Steve Gerber, once again. Yep. But yeah. Um, Fool Killer is one of those books that just, there were so many number ones that came out at that point. Why? Fool Killer was such a, I mean, there's a lot going on in those stories. Yeah. It was a lot going on. It was a pleasure to work on it because it was it was fun to read it. And, you mm -hmm. know, Steve wouldn't tell me what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> you so know, two Jeff things was like that. He, he would say, nope, not telling you. You're going to have to wait. My God, dick. <laughs> uh, I, I just started following your Instagram. So two things initially. Your Ratatouille looks fabulous. It's from that. It's from the movie Ratatouille. I, I saw that and I want to try it. Um, and I keep telling my wife. Make. It's really it not. It doesn't seem hard. No, I mean you're slicing all the vegetables, and then you you make you make a sauce which goes right. on the bottom, and then you place the vegetables, and then you sprinkle some stuff. But it cooks at a very low temperature for like two hours, okay. uh, and, and 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 covered, so it inf everything gets infused with it. And then when you want to serve it, you know the trick is to try to get you know like this little pile, which I'm not very good at, yeah, but it's, it, it's nice. really good. Uh, you know, I I don't really like normal ratatouille. Um, but the that particular dish, you know, I'm thrilled with, you know, with it. I mean, it always, it's very impressive to look at. And I think this is funny that it's so impressive to look at because it, it's not difficult. It's just time consuming. Right. It's Thomas Keller's recipe. Well, make sure I'll, I'll try to find you if you want the recipe. I'll send it to you. Um, oh, definitely. Yes. This is a perfect time to make ratatouille because it's it's all those vegetables that you're getting now. The, the green squash, yeah. the yellow squash, the, um, uh, the, the tomatoes and the um, eggplant. Um, and your uh, your smoked short ribs, they look attractive. Well, those were we did that for that was another that was a I work with the the cops. We do these huge barbecues for cops, uh, mm -hmm. and that was actually those was it the short ribs or it, it was might have been beef navel, which is kind of like a brisket. And we made BLTs except for it was uh, the brisket and and lettuce and tomato sandwiches and oh. Is that your smoke? I'm, I know we, we've kind no, of derailed the smoker. comic, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's his smoker which was okay. actually given to him as a gift from 
uh, Paul Shirley, who's the man that makes all these amazing smokers that we use at all of our benefits, because he saw that uh, he needed a better smoker for all these uh, things he does for the police, because it's all very all charity based. So that was his donation. And he's donated several big smokers to us um, for our barbecue, because we, you know, we're doing one in August for for about twenty five hundred veterans and their oh, families. Nice. That's awesome. So that's a lot of meat that we got to cook and all that. Everything gets donated uh, to us. So, um, wow. That's, a, that's yeah, amazing. it's, you know, but we eat good that day. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's well, a bunch of comics people that are, they're like, you know, they're into food uh, as well uh, and brewers. I'm also, I also brew beers. So I can't, I can't, I still can't focus. <laughs> and we are back. Greg is a wonderful guy. Uh, he's a straight shooter. We love that. So much more we need to talk to him about. We have to have him back on because there's so many things he brought up that I, we want to get into, books he's worked on that we want to talk about. So, uh, Greg, we hope you come back and join us. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you to our partners, Tomorrow's Publishing. Go check them out, T-W-O-M-O-R-O-W-S. Uh, see what they have for sale now. And we will see you guys soon. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.